named after their defining presidents, Roosevelt and Reagan. Uh, the Roosevelt dispensation, he says, was political, imagining an America that in, was involved in a collective enterprise of pursuing the four freedoms, freedom of speech and religion, freedom from want and fear. The Reagan dispensation is anti-political, imagining individuals, families, businesses, and small communities flourishing once freed from government interference. Liberals, he claims, allowed this anti-political dispensation to become dominant by abdicating, giving up power, abdicating their responsibility to define a new narrative that dealt with the ways American life had changed and with the ways that the New Deal had failed in the 1970s. Uh, instead, he argues liberals re retreated into campus identity politics, uh, thus losing both their appeal to ordinary people who didn't understand the academic jargon and their ability to inspire feelings of unity and patriotism necessary for holding together a big tent coalition that can win and wield power on a national level. He claims that this abdication was made easier because identity politics didn't challenge but reinforced the fundamental Reagan principle of individualism. Uh, what started as a movement for the rights of large marginalized identity groups like women and African Americans became, he says, a navel gazing uh, fractured into uh, myriad micro identities that shut out any, any collective solidarity. And this leaves vulnerable minorities that liberals claim to care about, he claims even, even more vulnerable to the rights campaign uh, against their expanded civil rights. Uh, so obviously Lilla is no fan of neoliberalism. After all, one of his main jabs at the identity politics of the left is that it's too neoliberal or too individualistic. But he does have a certain kind of respect for the way early neoliberals like Reagan were able to create new politics that fitted the realities of the 1980s, even as he'd have preferred a different politics and he thinks Reaganism no longer fits our reality in the 2020s. So let's look at what he has to say for Reagan and why he was so appealing. Uh, once we do that, we can hear Reagan's inaugural address for ourselves and maybe hear some of what Lula is hearing there. Um, so Lula writes that in 1980, the New Deal had a deathly power um, and New Deal ideals didn't feel true or inspiring anymore. But liberals didn't recognize that Reagan's conservatives were not just uh, the old kind of conservatives, reactionaries, uh, puppet of the pinstriped classes, um, but a new dispensation that could move hearts and minds and ideology that could capture something important in social reality, uh, which means that we need to understand why Reaganism was plausible so that liberals can offer an alternative vision, he says, based on, quote, a coldly realistic view of how we live now instead of declaring war on our own social reality. So he talks about um, the fall of 1989, the fall of the Soviet Union, um, oppressed people, you know, finally becoming citizens and earnestly debating their new constitutions, which is kind of a rose-colored view of post-Soviet reality. But uh, he contrasts that within the U.S. Uh, such civic virtues felt distant to people because we'd become more and more individualistic. Okay, let's take a look at some of these passages in Lilla where he talks about the Reagan dispensation and how it was so appealing. We must never forget that moving hearts and minds for more than one election cycle is not easy, and if an ideology endures, this means that it is capturing something important in social reality. Marx was right about this. Material conditions helped to determine which political ideas resonated in a historical moment, which means that if liberals are serious about supplanting Reaganism in the public imagination, they must first understand why it arose and retained its power to convince for so long. What changes in American economic and social life made that ideology plausible in the first place? Answering that question is an important exercise. Whatever vision of America and its future liberals eventually offer, it must be based on a coldly realistic view of how we live now. We got into politics with the country we have, not the country we might wish for. Reaganism endured because it did not declare war on the way most Americans were living and thinking about themselves. It fitted right in. Every revolution has material preconditions. Rising wages and public policies encouraged home and car ownership, triggered the vast growth of suburbs. People left the old familiar neighborhoods of families and friends. They found themselves in what seemed like virgin territory, surrounded by others to whom they had no connections. The birth control pill, no-fault divorce, legalized abortion, gave husbands and wives erotic independence from each other. Unsurprisingly, divorce rates spike. We have become a hyper-individualistic, bourgeois society, materially and in our cultural dogmas. It's hard for us to think or talk about any subject except in these self-regarding terms. The very concept of we now seemed suspect. And how did the Roosevelt Dispensation's concept of we come to seem suspect? Well, he writes, every catechism tends to become rigid and formulaic until it eventually becomes detached from social reality which is exactly what happened to American liberalism in the 1970s. 
None of its programs seemed capable of reversing the decline of big cities and the expansion of the welfare rolls. Roosevelt's political vision was no longer compelling to members of the relatively affluent, hyper-individualized, and suburbanized society America had become. Americans no longer felt that they needed one another as much, or owed much, to one another. And so Reagan offered them a new, anti-political conception of the good life that reinforced what they were experiencing out on the new frontier of suburbia. He drew on old tropes already in the country's imagination from pre-Roosevelt days, images of the self-reliant settler and yeoman farmer of family saying grace over a meal, of simple virtue threatened by urban life, or of a self-serving professional elite exploiting the less educated, and of a strong military resisting a clear and present danger. But he also subtly updated these images for a new and very different class of mainly white Americans, not rural families, but residents of subdivisions, where the only sound to be heard in the afternoon was the chick 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 sprinkler systems. People who had attended college, however briefly, and who worked in office parks or hospitals, not out on the range. The gap between the images and reality was large, but in a way that worked in Lincoln's favor. His vision was simultaneously nostalgic and futuristic. It convinced Americans that the happiness of the Golden Age was still attainable. Reagan abandoned the dour, scolding, apocalyptic style of 1950s conservatism and radiated hopefulness. After Jimmy Carter's sensible shoes and sensible sweater and sensible advice to lower the thermostat, Reagan beamed. Twilight? Not in America. Here it's sunrise every day. More important, he exuded admiration for Americans and didn't ask them to change a thing. After Jimmy Carter delivered his diagnosis of America's malaise, Reagan responded, I find no national malaise. I find nothing wrong with the American people. He even had the daring to tell voters they should re-elect Carter if he instilled in you pride for your country and a sense of optimism about our future. A brilliant parry that just reminded people how much they wanted to feel patriotic again. But the new patriotism was not political and certainly not connected in any way with government. The army recruiting slogan introduced in 1980 was Be All You Can Be, which could have been lifted from a Dale Carnegie book. During the George W. Bush administration, that slogan was changed again to An Army of One, which was more bellicose but no less individualistic. The good life Reagan promised America would emerge spontaneously as individuals and families went about their private business, especially business. A new American hero was born, the entrepreneur. The cult for the rose to worship him in the 1980s offered dreams of an easy path to nobility, open to anyone with an idea, a garage, and a few power tools. Easy in another sense, too, in that it made no moral demands. Americans have always been entrepreneurial and have always believed that the get rich is glorious. But our long-abandoned Calvinism treated wealth as a sign of moral worth fruit of discipline and self-denial, not the fruit of looking out for number one. The Horatio Alger stories were not Gordon Gecko stories, or Ivan Bosky stories, or Bernie Madoff stories. Those were all babies of people who were in some sort of financial scandal. The characters did not smoke big cigars or drink thousand dollar bottles of wine or take clients to strip clubs. For all his social conservatism, Ronald Reagan's vision of the good life was remarkably amoral. He did not explicitly preach or encourage hedonism. He did not extol the culture of impunity that developed during his presidency, but neither did he criticize it. He understood our libertarian society too well to make that mistake. So what I suggest is that you now go to YouTube and watch Reagan's first inaugural address and see what in the speech resonates with these passages from Lilla. If anything surprises you, if you kind of disagree with any of Lilith's interpretations of uh, what Reagan's vision was and what questions you have about the text, what's being said by Lilith and Reagan, and any connections you can make to your own life and our political and economic issues today. All right. Thanks for checking this out and uh, 